Chapter thirty four of Australia, New Zealand, and some other islands of the South Seas by Frank G. Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Some Freaks of Nature. Sinbad the Sailor, the bird expert of the Arabian Nights, should have come to New Zealand. Here he would have found a bird as tall as a giraffe that laid eggs as big as a pumpkin sinbad was never able to prove that his rock really existed but if you will come out to new zealand you can see for yourself remains of its giant bird the moa there is a stuffed one at christ church besides the skeletons of a dozen others i have examined the real eggs the moa laid when it trod the soil of this country a century or so ago the great moa is supposed to be the biggest bird ever created I sat down before the huge model of it in the museum at Christ Church and made these notes. If I were to stand under the bird, its tail feathers would tickle the top of my head. Its ankle is as big around as my calf, and its gray body is the size of a small haystack. Its tall, thin neck is stretched so high above its breast that Barnum's circus managers would have had a hard time getting the animal into a freight car its legs are as strong as those of a camel and it looks quite as big as the biggest ship of the desert its enormous feet have claws much like those of a turkey save that each is a foot long i doubt not the moa could have stamped out the life of a man at one kick beside one of the skeletons is placed the skeleton of an ordinary man the head of the bird rises at least eight feet above the skull of the man the bones of the moa were first discovered about eighty years ago and later great quantities of them were found the bird existed in new england within a comparatively recent period and there are maoris who say that their forefathers knew of it the probability is that it was here long before the maoris came and there is no doubt that it was once hunted and eaten in great numbers in old ovens that have been excavated bones of cooked moa have been found but as for who the moa hunters were and when they lived no one knows the moa eggs were each about a foot long one was found some years ago by a laborer digging the foundation of a house he had gone down several feet when he came upon the skeleton of a man in a sitting position the egg was held in the skeleton's bony fingers in such a manner as to bring it immediately opposite the mouth and it is supposed that it was placed there with the idea that the ghost of the dead might have something to eat during the intervals of his long sleep the stone spear and axe by the side of the man showed that he was probably a warrior and his skull bore evidence of having received several hard knocks possibly on the battlefield the egg was ten inches long and seven inches in diameter and its shell was as thick as a twenty-five cent piece it was perfectly empty but whether time or the dead warrior had sucked out the contents the records do not say though a bird the moa had no wings it seems to have been a giant addition of some of the strange birds new zealand has now for there are today in the dominion wingless birds not larger than good-sized chickens i refer to the kiwis some of which i have seen alive here at christchurch i have had several of them in my hands and by feeling carefully I found what seemed like a little lump on each side where the wings ought to be. Some say that the kiwi is without wings because the dense growth of the New Zealand bush prevented its flights, and so, through the ages, it lost its wings for lack of use. It makes up for this deficiency, however, by its swiftness of foot. It runs very fast, with its body held in an oblique position and its neck stretched forward. This bird has hair-like feathers of somewhat the color of a quail and a long bill sharp at the point with which it can bore down into the mud for worms its legs are much like those of the moa the kiwi is a night bird at canterbury college where i saw them the birds were penned up like chickens and had to be bought for me to examine them they seemed almost blinded by the light and ran about this way and that in apparent terror kiwis are becoming scarce in new zealand for the maoris are fond of them as food and their feathers are highly prized for cloaks 
they are now to be found only in the dense beds of ferns covering parts of new zealand it is difficult to catch them for they look much like the dead fern leaves and take refuge in crevices in the rocks and in the deep holes that they dig in the ground for their nests they used to be hunted with dogs one of the most curious things about this bird is the size of its egg which is almost as big as the kiwi itself it is a creamy white color and as smooth and as glossy as ivory another new zealand bird quite as strange as the kiwi is the kia parrot which kills sheep thousands of sheep have been destroyed by these birds the loss from them being so great that the government pays a bounty of one dollar a head as many as fifteen thousand kias have been killed in a year though they are no longer as numerous as formerly the kia has fastidious tastes it does not care for any part of the sheep except the kidneys and the fat surrounding them it has become as expert in anatomy as a surgeon and has learned just where the sheep's kidneys lie i am told that it strikes the right spot every time fastening its talons into the wool on the animal's back it bores with its bill into the side of the sheep directly over the kidneys making a hole as smooth as though the flesh had been cut round with a knife the kia tears out the kidneys and the fat and then leaves the sheep to die in great agony there are different theories as to how kias acquired this strange taste until sheep were introduced into new zealand the birds had lived on berries and insects then they began to pick the meat from the sheepskins hung up to dry later on they attacked the live sheep and after a time having discovered the kidneys ignored every other part of the animal whether the birds talk to each other or not i do not know but they hand on to one another as effectively as though they had a language their gruesome way of butchering sheep there is one place in the dominion where the kia's life is safe that is at the hermitage on the sunny slopes of mount cook where the government maintains a sanctuary in order that this parrot may not become entirely extinct the hermitage is the starting place for those who try to scale new zealand's loftiest mountain and some of the people who have stayed there bring back stories of the doings of the kias they are great thieves and one woman tells how her moccasins were stolen from the window sill of her room others complain of being kept awake at night by the kias squawking and clawing up and down on the corrugated iron roof of the hotel if the birds get hold of a pillow they will tear it all to pieces perhaps thinking that inside the soft substance they will find some of the kidney fat they love kiwis and kias are however but a few of the freaks that mother nature has placed in this out-of-the-way part of the world there are others so strange that i hesitate to mention them in new zealand there are no kangaroos but there are marsupial rats here and i saw at the college a mouse not much larger than a good-sized cricket with a pouch for bringing up its young this mouse which is one of the smallest marsupials known, is now very rare. It is a part of the biological collection of the College Museum at Christchurch and was shown me by the chief biologist. He showed me also a live lizard, the Tuatera, which is a descendant of a family of three-eyed lizards. The third eye is in the middle of the head and is clearly visible through the skin of the young animal, but becomes thickly covered when he reaches maturity. The scientists say there is little doubt that this eye was once used. The lizard I looked at was about a foot long, and I should say measured two inches in diameter. But better than the mother mouse and the three-eyed lizard, I liked the black swans of New Zealand. They are to be seen in all parts of the islands, and one can shoot them anywhere around the lakes. They are even more beautiful than the white swans, and as they sail along, in the water their feathers look just like black plush then there are the swamp hens which with their bright blue bodies and red legs look as a woman who had been in the united states said to me the other day like your mystic shriners on parade i must not forget to mention the strangest pet any country ever had this was a dolphin the only whale i ever heard of which had its own special act of parliament when passing through Polaris Sound on the trip between Wellington on the North Island and Nelson on the South Island, one always hears the story of Polaris Jack. 
he was a big silvery gray fellow different from all the other whales in these waters and he had a habit of going out to meet incoming ships he would escort them for miles and then go back to his own haunts he would play about the vessels and even rub himself against their sides and one theory was that he came to the boats so as to rub his back against their keels and thus rid himself of parasites another was that he loved playing in the waves ruffled up by the ships the fame of polaris jack spread until there were tourist trips into the sound to see him and parliament passed a law to protect him for there was always a fear that some of the whalers in these waters might kill him in fact it was said that one ship injured him and that he would never meet that steamer again but at last he disappeared some hold a party of norwegian whalers responsible for his death while others believe he was killed by one of the mines sowed by a german raider during the world war perhaps he merely died of old age for the maoris claim that he was not under two hundred and seventy-five years old once it is said he had a mate but if so he never brought his wife out to greet the tourists new zealand has some curiosities of vegetable life quite as remarkable as those of her animal world one of the strangest is what is known as the vegetable caterpillar this looks like a real caterpillar two inches long with a sprout like a horn growing out of its head when it is full grown the sprout comes out and takes root and becomes a vigorous plant about eight inches tall with a single stem but no leaf the only one i have seen was a plant that had been dried after being taken out of the ground i might also speak of new zealand flax which i have seen at many places on the islands this flax which grows wild and on swamp lands has thick blades about two inches wide and five or six feet long in the middle of the clustered blades grows the tall straight flax stick with seed pods at the top the upstanding new zealand men are often called flax sticks when the blades are harvested at intervals of three years the green covering is stripped from them leaving the fiber exposed this is washed hung up to bleach and then made into tow and cordage it competes successfully with the hemp of manila and thousands of tons are exported every year of late years the flax fields have suffered from a small fly which makes holes in the leaves and so reduces the quantity of good fiber since it has been found that drained swamp lands makes the richest dairy farms it is a question whether it is best to drain them for cattle runs or leave them to produce flax a product almost as valuable as flax in the export trade of the dominion is cori gum it is a solidified turpentine or fossil resin which is found in great chunks in the ground in the north island the lumps may be the size of a walnut or as big as a man's head and single pieces have been found weighing as much as one hundred pounds it is often as clear as amber but varies greatly in color sometimes it is a rich yellow sometimes brown and sometimes just the color of champagne some of the best of it is sold to the manufacturers of varnish and linoleums the bulk of it being sent to the united states kari gum is by no means a cheap article selling for more than four hundred and fifty dollars a ton and the annual export is worth nearly two million dollars hundreds of men go over the quarry forests with spears and picks looking for this gum they drive their spears down into the earth and when they strike a piece dig it out the gum lies within a limited area consisting of about seven hundred thousand acres north of auckland and about thirty thousand acres southeast of that city part of this is government land upon which the right to dig quarry is sold at so much a year most of the diggers are austrian but some are maoris and some english australian settlers the austrians make a regular business of hunting quarry and working in bands of thirty or more the settlers dig for the gum when they are not farming and the maoris seek it to supplement their funds when food runs low many of the austrian gum diggers make more than twenty five dollars a week this gum appears on the quarry pine a tree that often grows one hundred and fifty feet high and twelve feet in diameter the quarry is about the best timber of new zealand 
and is used largely in building and furniture making the gum comes from the great forests of the past which have rotted away some of the standing quarry trees are bled for their resin like our turpentine forests of the southern states but this method is illegal and most of the product is still obtained from the deposits in the ground quarry is used by the varnish and linoleum manufacturers because it assimilates oil easily and at low temperatures as the new zealand deposits are worked from year to year the gum gets more and more expensive and in anticipation of their giving out the question of substitutes has been studied china wood oil extracted from nuts and exported from hankow china is now being extensively used and has become a keen competitor of cori end of chapter thirty four chapter thirty five of australia new zealand and some other islands of the south seas by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b american goods in new zealand in the foregoing chapters i have mentioned two facts that should mean much to the exporters of the united states one is that new zealand is an agricultural country exporting raw materials and importing manufactured articles and the other is that the per capita wealth of all persons of more than twenty years of age is about four thousand dollars in other words new zealand is dependent on foreign markets as outlets for her rich agricultural production and on foreign factories to supply her needs for finished goods and she has the money to pay for what she wants the total foreign trade imports and exports comes to more than four hundred dollars a year for every one of her people this the new zealanders claim is the highest per capita foreign trade in the world in some years half the amount has been spent for goods brought in from other countries in traveling here one sees everywhere evidences of prosperity and a high level of comfort the people are well dressed and live in modern well-built houses unlike australia new zealand has a big rural population and about half the inhabitants live out on the land or in country villages there are only four cities of any size but there are a hundred towns of one or two thousand and perhaps a dozen ranging between two and ten thousand all are up to date in their conveniences and equipment the new zealand cities have their theaters libraries and stores their banks and their factories each has its cricket club and its recreation grounds and the people devote a large part of their time to amusements and sports the short working day gives leisure to the wage earners they leave their jobs in time to dress for the evening and take their families to the movies where they often see american films during the half holiday they spend more money than if they were at work in proportion to its population auckland the commercial metropolis has more rich men than any other city in new zealand although wellington the capital is growing the fastest on the south island the largest city is christchurch it is on the famous canterbury plains the garden spot of new zealand south of it is dunedin with a population of sixty thousand christchurch and dunedin are rival towns the feeling between the people of the two places being much the same as that between the populations of minneapolis and st paul christ church was founded by a group of church of england settlers who gave it its religious name dunedin was started by scotch presbyterians at about the same time and in its early days it was by no means safe to question election justification sanctification or infant damnation within its precincts the scotch colonists wanted to name this settlement after their capital at home but there were so many edinburghs in the world that they decided on the celtic name for edinburgh and called the place dunedin today nine-tenths of the people of dunedin are of scotch descent and the place is a magnet for scottish immigrants there are scotch names over the stores scotch names for the streets and the little stream that runs through the north end of the town is called the water of leith when i ask a rosy-faced boy the name of one of the churches 
he replied with a thick brogue that sore is the first kirk the dunedin men say that their churches are far better off than those of the rival city they are all out of debt and have money in the bank when the city was founded one-tenth of all the land was set aside for the church this is leased out for twenty-one years at a time on condition that at the close of each such lease all improvements made shall belong to the church dunedin is in the rich otago province which irrigation has made into a great fruit-producing region grapes peaches pears nectarines and several kinds of nuts are raised in abundance for a time the industry suffered from the great numbers of birds but the importation of the german owl which killed off most of them solved that difficulty daring and sheep raising are carried on almost as extensively as on the canterbury plains and the farmers raise four good crops of alfalfa in a year there are four big woolen mills in the neighborhood of dunedin and here also is one of the car shops of the government railways another local industry is the freezing of thousands of rabbits for export our trade with new zealand is rapidly increasing every year we sell our goods valued at nearly forty million dollars or more than eighteen per cent of the total imports great britain has the bulk of the trade but the united states comes next and then australia there is no doubt that we might double our share if we tried hard enough i have met a number of american salesmen all of whom say that they are doing well they are however somewhat handicapped by the bad impression created by that class of our commercial travelers who are forever bragging of their country and overpraising their goods this is particularly distrustful to all new zealanders and especially so to the business man on the whole however the people like our goods and are friendly to the yankees as they call us a salesman i met the other night in the chief hotel at dunedin he has been selling goods here and in other parts of australasia during the past five years said he american goods are fast making their way in this part of the world i am the agent for several large companies and am doing well we are selling printing paper by the ton there is a good demand for farming machinery of all kinds and tens of thousands of acres of sheep pastures are enclosed in fences of american wire our automobiles are the most popular and the country is alive with flivvers the new zealanders bought ten million dollars worth of our cars in a single year to say nothing of four million dollars worth of tires they have spent as much again on our gasoline and oils american bicycles are sold everywhere and in spite of their higher prices our carpenters tools are preferred to those of europe recently i took a big order for steel rails we have also a good business in electrical supplies the government is undertaking to develop new zealand's water power it has picked out no less than seventy two sites for hydroelectric projects and it has a big program under way the lake coleridge plant seventy miles from christchurch serves a population of more than one hundred thousand and enables christchurch to have a two cent fare on its municipally owned streetcar lines the waikato plant seventeen miles from the town of cambridge in the north island can generate eighty four hundred horsepower and the waipori falls project furnishes eighty thousand horsepower for the city and factories of dunedin extensions of these three plants are being pushed and the government has plans for other installations which will give electric energy to practically all the towns and rural districts of the north island such projects should mean more business for the electrical supply firms of the united states our firms are selling connecticut clocks illinois farm machinery and massachusetts watches i saw american typewriters in wellington there is a good market for all sorts of yankee notions the other day while riding on a train with a new zealand merchant i asked him what he thought of american goods pulling his right foot from under his traveling rug he put it up on the seat beside me you see those shoes said he they are american they are the easiest shoes i have ever had on they have not troubled me a day since i bought them the new zealand government is one of the chief customers for manufactured goods it owns the railroads builds bridges and operates coal mines hence its purchases are enormous 
it buys all sorts of iron and steel building materials as well as hardware galvanized roofing elevators irrigation pumps and all kinds of machinery and engineering apparatus we now have the best consular service of any commercial nation and new zealand offers a splendid field for its operations times have changed both in this dominion and in australia since the day typified by the young man who got himself appointed consul at melbourne his only business experience had been as postmaster in his little home town in wisconsin he was asked by an american why he did not keep the state department posted on the openings for american trade and on the big business developments going on everywhere he replied that he reported upon all things that the department directly asked for but that he did not consider it best to advertise the great trade opportunities of australia for fear it might call them to the attention of other nations new zealand buyers give to british firms as many orders as they can without too great a sacrifice of their own interests this is especially true since the world war as the people are anxious to do what they can to stimulate british trade and thus help the mother country pay her enormous debt and regain prosperity i find here a strong love for old england many new zealanders even those born and bred here speak of a trip there as going home and of british articles as goods made at home the dominion appears entirely content under the british crown doubtless because the bonds binding her are not tight for example in the world war great britain could not have conscripted soldiers from the dominion as france did from algeria it was the people themselves who decided in favor of compulsory military service though not until many thousands of young men had already volunteered and gone overseas in australia conscription was defeated by the voters of the commonwealth i recently visited invercargill the town farthest south on this side of the world it is the bottom city of the pacific far below the latitude of cape town at the tip of africa and almost as far south as punta arenas at the tail of south america it is at the extreme south of new zealand and as nice a little city of fifteen thousand people as you will find anywhere the town is as well built as any of the same size in the united states it has waterworks good schools a public library and a beautiful park upon the waters of which swim half a dozen jet black swans walking through the streets i stopped at an agricultural implement store it was filled with farming machinery and i noticed that at least half of the stock was american there were several chicago drills two ohio harvesters and some illinois plows i talked with the proprietor he said he had a good sale for american reapers and all sorts of american farming tools but that the british and canadians are trying to crowd us out of the market said he one of your chief competitors is canada the canadian firms will sell on longer time and we can get better prices for their goods on that account we have to give a discount for cash and cash sales are much harder to make on the same street i saw american bicycles in a shop window and farther up american hand saws at present most of the cotton sold here come from england but the people are beginning to buy our print goods i saw some in a wellington dry goods store and asked the merchant where he got them he replied that he had given an american firm a trial order and that they were selling well he showed me his invoice it was for eight thousand dollars and this he called a trial order most firms in the united states would consider it a pretty good one but this part of the world is so far away that the merchants must buy a whole season's stock in one consignment and there is no chance for a reorder end of chapter thirty five Chapter 36 of Australia, New Zealand, and Some Other Islands of the South Seas by Frank G. Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. The Fijis and the Tongas. The ports of Australia and New Zealand swarm with sea captains, traders, and others who know the South Seas as you know the palm of your hand. The Canadian Pacific steamers plying between Vancouver and Sydney by way of hawaii call at the fijis and the tongas are easily reached from auckland new zealand during my stay in these waters 
i have had the many talks about these faraway islands that form the basis of what follows i have spoken of the tongas as being easily reached from new zealand this seems a strange statement when i tell you that they are about as far from auckland as new york is from cuba distances mean little in the south seas however the fijis are eleven hundred miles from auckland and the tongas are only a few hundred miles nearer yet new zealand once wanted them put under its government the idea was to establish here a british island empire which should be two thousand miles in length or longer than the distance from canada to the gulf of mexico the project fell through and the two archipelagos are still crown colonies the tongas being under the british high commissioner for the western pacific who is also governor of the fijis there are men still living who can tell stories of the days when the fijians were the most bloodthirsty cannibals on earth they made human sacrifices and widows were burned on the funeral pyres of their husbands when a chief built a home he planted a living victim under each post and when his canoes were launched he used men as rollers upon which the craft slid down into the sea when he died his wives were strangled to line his grave such a thing as killing a baby was too common for notice the last king of the fijis the Kambau, was the son of tanoa a notorious man-eater the Kambau himself was something of a cannibal but his father craved human flesh as a matinee maiden craves candy he sent his war canoes about the south sea islands for victims and they often brought back cargoes of dead men women and even babies upon their return everyone joined in a feast of human flesh one can still see on the islands the ovens in which the cooking was done they were filled with red-hot stones and it is related by the missionaries that victims were often roasted alive at one time fifty bodies were cooked and at another eighty women were strangled for a single feast whenever the stock of dead enemies ran low the king used to send his men to the watering places to lie in ambush for fishermen or for women who had gone down to bathe king thakambau killed his first victim when he was six years old and he was famous as a cannibal until the time of his conversion by the missionaries it was after he reformed that he made the treaty which gave these islands to england the story of this treaty is interesting the home of a white trader named williams who was acting as united states consul to fiji was burned and the natives stole some of the furniture and stores while the house was ablaze williams demanded three thousand dollars damages the fijian king refused then williams got the backing of the united states government and finally the sum of forty five thousand dollars was demanded it was out of the question for the savage king and his subjects to raise this sum so when certain money lenders of australia offered to settle the claim in return for two hundred thousand acres of its best land the Kambau joyfully accepted but the british government would not permit this transaction thereupon the Kambau agreed to cede the fijis to great britain if she would pay the debt a commission visited the islands and reported adversely on the proposal but in eighteen seventy four convinced that the islands needed the rule of a civilized power the british made a treaty with the Kambau annexing his whole domain meantime the claim of the united states had been allowed to drop during our civil war and was never revived though no longer master of the fijis after the british took possession the Kambau continued to live in royal state at his death his mantle fell to his son the high chief ratu apeli nilatakau who kept up all the show of royalty he possessed no real power but he made the natives treat him with the most abject respect only the highest chiefs were permitted to enter his house at mbao and even they must crouch silently against the wall and await his invitation to speak whenever he was through smoking a cigar he would indicate by a nod which chief might have the honor of finishing the butt a new clean mat was unrolled for his dinner table about which crept the men and women who bore him food no commoner was allowed to eat in his presence canoes loaded down with yams coconuts turtles and yakona root for making the native drink kava were constantly landing at mbao 
the offerings were carried humbly to the door of ratu apelli and the natives crouched outside gently clapping their hands until their tributes were graciously accepted in the days of his grandfather tanoa any island that failed to furnish the expected tribute was frightfully punished when the people of the island of maliki designated to provide turtles for the king so far forgot themselves as to eat some of their catch tanoa sent a fleet of war canoes every man and woman on the island was killed while the children were taken captive to mbao so that the boys there might earn their titles as killers of men by clubbing them to death the fijians of today are among the most civilized of all the south sea islanders they have been converted to christianity and have their own native preachers they are divided among a half dozen denominations with the methodists claiming the largest number of converts the oldest established church in the islands is that of the methodist mission founded in eighteen twenty five the missionaries established the first schools in the fijis and until a few years ago the education of the natives was left entirely to the methodists and the catholics the government now maintains a high school near the town of suva where the sons of chiefs are trained and it also helps other schools that comply with its requirements at an industrial school near suva the islanders are taught boat building iron working and other manual arts boys are entered for terms of five years children of european residents are educated at government expense in separate institutions the fiji islands were discovered in 1643 by tasman the dutch navigator the same man who discovered tasmania and new zealand their area is less than that of new jersey and their total population is little more than that of dayton ohio only about half the people are native fijians for some years their number decreased steadily but this decline seems now to have been checked the people are especially subject to epidemics in eighteen seventy five measles was brought into the islands by sailors from a british ship the disease took a most virulent form and killed forty thousand natives in a short time great numbers of them died when influenza swept the world in nineteen seventeen and nineteen eighteen the fijians are strong and well built and in appearance far superior to our american indians they have dark copper skins and frizzly hair which stands up about their heads in enormous mops making them seem tall in order to get their hair to stick up they plaster it with damp lime which bleaches it to an auburn shade so that they look very grotesque when young the women are handsome having pretty eyes and well-molded faces in the settled regions they wear loose cotton gowns but back in the interior the usual attire is a fringe of grass about the waist a string of beads and a fan the men wear about the same costume one frequently sees a native with a long pin or scratcher thrust through his hair this weapon is used to make war upon the vermin with which almost every head is infested sometimes the irritation gets beyond the scratching point and in desperation the man so attacked kindles a fire of banana leaves and lying down with his head near the fire thus smokes out his unwelcome visitors the fijians are good-natured they are cleanly and spend a great part of their time in the water after every bath they rub themselves down with coconut oil the rancid odor of which enables one to smell a native long before seeing him though they are practically all christians the natives cling stubbornly to many of their old customs one of these is the performance of the fire walkers on the island of bika is a circular pit about twenty feet in diameter the bottom is lined with volcanic stones and when a fire walk is to be staged the pit is filled with dry sticks and a fire is kept up until the stones are red hot then the glowing coals are brushed aside and out of the forest comes a procession of young men their bodies gleaming with coconut oil and garlanded with flowers slowly they tread over the hot stones singing as they go then they vanish into the dense woods apparently unhurt after they have gone whole pigs and vegetables are put on the hot stones and covered with leaves and earth soon a well-cooked feast is ready for both spectators and performers scientists say that the volcanic stones used are poor heat conductors 
and that they radiate heat quickly thus the surface cools sufficiently to permit the fire walkers to tread the stones though they retain enough heat inside to cook the feast at any rate nothing will persuade the fire walkers to step on hot limestone which is a good conductor and a poor radiator the thickness of the skin on the soles of the natives unshod feet no doubt accounts in great measure for the miracle many natives live in and about suva and lavuka the principal towns but most of them dwell in villages scattered over the islands a fiji village consists almost entirely of thatched huts with walls of woven bamboo built without the use of nails the roofs are thick and the thatch is so skillfully put on that it seems to be woven some of the houses are conical in shape others oblong and others oval the usual hut has but one room in which the whole family stays in the daytime when it rains and where all sleep at night the bed is a mat on the floor and the pillow a bamboo log which is placed under the neck in order to keep the sleeper's headdress well up from the ground there is but little cooking as raw fruit forms a large part of the diet of the people the chief ports of the fijis suva and lavuka have steamship service to sydney auckland the tongas and the samoa islands an excursion to suva which is also the capital is a popular winter trip for new zealanders besides the natives about a thousand europeans live there most of them in well-built modern houses its chief street the victoria parade is lined on one side with rain trees whose thick foliage protects one from the sun and on the other side with hotels and business houses the british governor has his office at suva he lives there like a king in a palace that cost about a hundred thousand dollars the governor of the fijis is appointed by the king of england and gets a salary of fifteen thousand dollars a year besides the five thousand he is paid as high commissioner of the western pacific he has a sort of cabinet or executive council the laws for the islands are made by a legislative council of which he is president there are a large number of district chiefs and native magistrates and seven of the provinces have resident supervisors to assist the chiefs in ordinary matters the native laws and customs are respected as far as possible there is a constabulary of fijians and east indians besides the defense force which is composed of europeans half castes and natives most of the money made in the fijis comes from sugar plantations and coconut groves upon the higher portions of the islands coffee is now being grown and yields about five hundred pounds to the acre a large number of tea gardens have been set out and some planters are making money from rubber each coconut tree has an average yield of a hundred nuts per annum and brings in about a dollar per year net at this rate a grove of ten thousand trees will mean ten thousand dollars a year and as the trees are set close together ten thousand do not take up any great area after the trees are once planted little needs to be done until they begin to bear at the end of from five to seven years the nuts are broken open and the meat is cut up and dried to be shipped abroad as copra for use in making soaps hair restorers and nut butter nearly all the profitable enterprises in the islands are owned or backed by englishmen the chief difficulty that confronts them is the labor problem having few wants and being blessed by nature with the means of supplying them without much trouble the fijians feel no need to work sustained effort they abhor although in their own way they are industrious and are the best native carpenters and canoe builders in the south seas it was just a year after the british took over the islands that the measles epidemic decimated the population so that what with the decreased number of the fijians and the natives distaste for work the plantation owners had to import laborers workers were brought in from india the solomon islands the gilberts and the new hebrides the government regulated the employment of imported labor it cost about seventy five dollars to bring in a native from the new hebrides and forty dollars to get one from the gilberts and the employer had to agree to return the laborers at his own expense at the close of their engagement 
it cost more to import the east indians but they were usually hired for terms of five years on the understanding that they should have food free for six months after their arrival and free lodgings and medical care for the whole term their wages were paid weekly the men receiving twenty five cents a day and the women eighteen cents more and more coolies were imported from india while the numbers brought from other islands fell off at the close of their terms of service many of the east indians took up little plantations of their own where they grew rice sugar coconuts and bananas there are now upward of sixty thousand of them in the islands compared with about ninety thousand fijians five thousand europeans and a sprinkling of half castes polynesians and chinese as in other british colonies to which they have been admitted the east indians have bred a serious race problem and their further importation has been stopped they declare themselves as good as the whites and demand equal rights with them a few years ago half the indian population went on a strike which reached such a climax of violence that it had to be put down with military force eighty per cent of the trade of the fijis is with australia and new zealand and the total amounts to about twenty two million dollars a year some of the imports come from the united states we supply them with timber oil hardware and cheap clocks and watches the fijian will use none but an american axe which he likes because it is light sharp and well tempered he likes also american-made knives or machetes with blades about fifteen inches long with which he clears his fields and gathers his bananas and coconuts the people buy about one and a half million dollars worth of cottons yearly and there is a demand for canned meats and flour as high commissioner of the western pacific the british governor of the fijis looks after the tongas which lie about two hundred miles southeast of the nearest of the fijis they still have a native ruler salote the queen of the tongans who handles native matters through her high chiefs the government is in fact a sort of hereditary monarchy under the british crown the tongas have a total area about one-tenth that of connecticut the largest of them is only twenty miles long and many are little more than atolls and coral rocks rising out of the sea some of them are volcanic but their soil is well suited to growing coconuts and sugar the entire population would hardly make a city of twenty five thousand inhabitants and there is only one town nukua lofa the capital it has a racetrack and cricket grounds and claims some of the finest motor roads south of the equator end of chapter thirty six chapter thirty seven of australia new zealand and some other islands of the south seas by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the samoas in coming from the fijis to apia the capital of western samoa our ship crossed the date line and when we sailed over the one hundred eightieth meridian east longitude we went from one day into the day before i felt some satisfaction in getting back one of the many days i have lost in going across the pacific in the opposite direction it was delightful sailing along the equator we had nothing but sunshine and such glorious sunshine as we coasted the island of savai the largest of the samoan group the air was fresh and the wind strong enough to make it cool and pleasant the sea was steel blue with silvery white caps dancing upon it between us and the shore and the sky was full of white smoky clouds the volcanic island of savai is its thick cloak of verdure makes one think of the hawaiian islands as we passed along its shores it seemed a great hill shaped like a horseshoe with the ends of the shoes sloping down to the water going on we soon reach upolu on the north coast of which apia is situated both upolu and savai now belong to the territory of western samoa which has been created from what was formerly german samoa and is now administered by new zealand under a mandate from the league of nations the united states owns tutuila manua and some of the smaller islands of the group when germany and the united states came to their agreement about the division of the samoas in eighteen ninety nine 
the germans in their greed for land were glad to take the two biggest islands but out here it is thought that we got the best of the bargain both savaii and upolu together are not so large as rhode island and much of savaii has been so recently subject to volcanic action as to be unfit for cultivation savaii is forty eight miles long and twenty five miles wide and upolu is a good deal smaller both islands are mountainous and well watered like tutuila they have been built up by volcanoes and are for the most part surrounded by coral reefs as i came into the harbor of apia the tide was low and i could see a great garden of coral rising out of the water here and there along the shore were groves of coconut trees and farther up the mountains plantations of cacao amid the green jungle on the hills i noticed patches of chocolate brown where the ground had been cleared for cacao plantations just back of apia gleamed the white villa where robert louis stevenson lived and above it rose mountain after mountain of different shades of green or blue covered with vegetation and canopied by masses of fleecy clouds here the shadows turned the sea to green and there to navy blue while upon the land they made a mass of light and dark patches of velvet on the green crops and the still deeper green forest close to the water's edge were what from our steamer looked like vast cornfields these the captain said were coconut orchards containing tens of thousands of trees loaded with millions of nuts i am disappointed in apia from robert louis stevenson's letters and the place it once held in international affairs i had expected to find it a large city it is really a small town with a foreign population of less than five hundred british germans new zealanders and swedes with a few americans and french for good measure its buildings are bungalows with roofs of galvanized iron strung around the harbor our steamer was greeted by a great crowd of samoans and the whole population of foreigners through which i went up to the tivoli hotel my headquarters during my stay it did not take me long to exhaust the sights of apia the town has a half dozen business houses engaged in shipping cacao and copra and in furnishing the natives with different kinds of fancy goods cottons and tinned stuffs there are also two photographers a number of consuls and a baker's dozen or so of government officials my guide over the island of upolu was one of the samoan chiefs he was half naked when i came into his house a kind of thatched shack not far from apia but he dressed himself in my presence and went about with me i found that he spoke good english knew the islands well and was very intelligent as are all the natives i have so far met with him i visited many of the native houses owing to the hot climate the samoan dwelling is scarcely more than a roof made of plaited branches supported on a number of slender posts through which all the airs of heaven may circulate the walls are mats of fibre which are rolled up inside and against the roof when not in use and which may be let down to keep out the wind and rain not a nail is used in the construction of such a house but instead the parts are tied together with yards of plaited coconut fibre called sinnet the men spend much of their leisure time plaiting sinnet some of which is as fine as twine the floor of the typical hut is a circular terrace raised about two feet above the ground and surrounded by a shallow ditch the terrace is made of stones closely fitted together and over it is spread a layer of white coral pebbles gathered from the beach to form the carpet for the hut the pebbles which serve for mattresses as well as floor covering are sometimes known as samoan feathers when the native is ready for bed he simply lays a fiber or grass mat upon them takes down his pillow from the rafters crawls under his mosquito net and goes off to the land of nod his pillow is no more than a little log set on four short legs so as to raise his head well off the floor the samoans have always been noted for their hospitality they give all strangers a cordial welcome and food lodging and even clothing may be had in any native house without thought of compensation nevertheless when a white visitor stays in a samoan home he gives presents on leaving to the full value of his entertainment no native guest ever does this 
but the foreigners have been so liberal in the past that they have led the people to expect gifts no samoan host would however lower himself so greatly as to take money in almost every settlement there is a topo or maid of the village elected by the people to receive guests and take a leading part in all public ceremonies and festivals when she goes any distance from home the maiden is surrounded by a train of elderly women as chaperones she holds office for a few years or until she is married the samoans are a clean people everywhere i see them in bathing the women and the men wade about waist deep in the streams and swim together in the surf splashing one another and acting more like children than grown-ups the young women have beautiful forms they are as straight as the statue of venus in the capitoline museum at rome and as plump and as well formed as the venus de medici their complexions are of a rich chestnut brown and their large soulful eyes are full of smiles unfortunately they often bleach their hair black to a bright red by the use of lime both women and men are good-natured gentle kind and easily governed i have been asked to investigate the chances for americans to get rich in the samoan islands robert louis stevenson made about twenty thousand dollars a year out of his books but as far as i can learn for all his sweating on his cacao plantation he did not get a cent out of it the islands have an excellent climate it is good for consumptives and if the consumptive were anything else than an impractical newspaper or literary man he might prosper at coconut raising or in growing cacao there are cacao planters on upolu who are making money cacao plants produce the seeds from which chocolate is made the trees are planted in rows about fourteen feet apart and it is four years before they come into bearing after that time if properly cared for they are profitable one samoan planter has recently netted more than twelve hundred dollars a year from sixty acres and there are others who are doing equally well this man has three thousand trees planted at pago pago and expects to set out more another planter i have heard of got nine hundred dollars a year from less than eight acres of cacao in american samoa it is estimated that two-thirds of all the land in the samoan islands is suitable for the growing of cacao as to coconuts there is money to be made in raising them on almost any of the pacific islands during my stay at apia i have heard much about things in our part of the samoan islands the tutuelans now consider themselves american citizens and hurrah for the stars and stripes as enthusiastically as we do on the fourth of july the government has brought quiet to the island torn for years by strife among the different tribes figuratively speaking the people are now turning their swords into pruning hooks we are ruling the samoans after the dutch method that is we are working through their chiefs and allowing them to govern themselves every village is a little republic with its own chief who is in most cases a hereditary ruler our naval officers who administer the islands sit behind the chiefs and pull the strings and the people think they are ruling themselves unless inconsistent with our laws native customs are never changed without the consent of the people missionary work is encouraged the island of manua contains about twenty square miles it is mountainous and surrounded by coral reefs the mountains are about a half mile in height but the land rises so gradually that the whole island can be cultivated the manawans are much the same as the tutuelans except that being out of the line of ocean steamship travel they are less advanced they have had missionaries for the last century and are christians they have churches and schools and live peacefully under their king producing enough food for themselves and selling enough copra to satisfy their few other wants coconut and banana plantations are being put out on all our islands the american naval officers with whom i have talked have nothing but good to say of the people when the americans first took possession a party of officers was received in great state by the king of manua who insisted on treating them to kava before he discussed business he had his chiefs with him and the queen sat beside him during the audience the kava was brought in by the bell of the island in a cup 
fastened to a branch of coconut palm it was given first to the king who handed it back to her whereupon she filled it and again gave it to his majesty after pouring some on the ground he took a drink of it it was next presented to the officers in the order of their rank and they had to drink it although they knew of the traditional way of making this native beverage kava comes from a root grown in the pacific islands and by the old formula is made in the following manner the kava is washed and cut up into little cubes then a young girl preferably a pretty girl after washing her hands and rinsing her mouth begins to work she puts one cube of kava into her mouth and chews it vigorously when it is well masticated she adds another and another until she has in her cheeks a mass of fiber as big as an egg this she takes out and lays in a large flat bowl and then begins to form another egg she keeps on making eggs until all of the root is chewed then water is poured into the bowl and the girl begins to knead the fibrous mass under it when it is strained it is a milky liquid that tastes for all the world like a mixture of soap suds and bitters it is not considered intoxicating but when taken in excess it goes to one's knees so that for a time the imbiber cannot walk straight this drink is used in all the islands of the pacific in the out-of-the-way samoas a person making kava has the right to ask any girl who is passing no matter who she may be to come in and chew his root for him in most parts of samoa this practice of chewing has died out and the roots are now pounded up with stones instead in the more remote districts i am told the old custom prevails the london missionary society is doing much good throughout all parts of samoa it has been working here for three generations and claims thousands of converts to christianity roman catholics also have missionaries on some of the islands the samoans are naturally religious and the level of their morality is far higher than that of the foreigners who bring in whiskey and introduce the vices of civilization to these southern seas there are it is true high-class businessmen scattered through the various archipelagos but the average beach-combing trader is as a rule a curse instead of a blessing and most of the evils that have come to the people are due to him for many of us the chief interest of the samoas lies in the fact that it was near apia that robert louis stevenson passed the last years of his life and did much of his writing while i was there i rode up to bailima the big rambling house in which he lived some time after his death the place was purchased by a wealthy german planter who did all he could to dispel the stevenson atmosphere and soon destroyed most of the vestiges of the former owner's taste he put up a sign over the gate beginning with eingang verboten and going on to say in english french and samoan as well as german that strangers were forbidden to come inside the enclosure he allowed stevenson's tomb to become overgrown with weeds and the pilgrimages to it from the incoming ships became fewer every year now vilima is the official residence of the administrator of western samoa and stevenson's memory is kept much greener than it was in the days of german control once more travelers go up the steep mountain path to the peak of vaia where he was buried as he had requested you recall how much the samoans love their tusitala or teller of tales as they called stevenson part of the road from apia to vailima was laid by them and christened the road of the loving hearts at his funeral it was the natives who had worked with him who bore stevenson's body up the steep path to the mountain top where he now lies with the pacific at his feet on his tombstone are the lines of the requiem he had written to be inscribed there under the wide and starry sky dig the grave and let me lie glad did i live and gladly die and i laid me down with a will this be the verse you grave for me here he lies where he longed to be home is the sailor home from the sea and the hunter home from the hill end of chapter thirty seven end of australia new zealand and some other islands of the south seas by frank g carpenter